Good morning. I invite you to rise. Welcome to church. Among the families of our congregation, we come with a whole range of emotions. We rejoice with the Thompson family because Adrian and Jamie had a baby boy born safely last night. And we're really thankful that Elliot James arrived and is healthy and all is well. And we give thanks along with the Thompson family for his arrival. But you'll also recognize perhaps a lot of Walter's families, a Walter family among us. Anne Walters was called home this past Wednesday. And for her sake, we're glad that she's at rest. And yet for the family's sake, we recognize the loss that is for them and for our congregation. And so there's grief mixed in with our thankfulness. And so here we are, we bring all those different emotions into the sanctuary and come before God. And we're gathered here to worship him and to hear again his promises and the comfort that he offers through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so we begin by singing, Here I Am to Worship. standing please our call to worship comes from Isaiah 40 comfort comfort my people says your God speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins and in that hope and in that comfort and that promise we're gathered to worship our God Let's continue doing that in a time of silent prayer. Each of us quietly coming to God and asking for His closeness, for Him to speak to us, and for His Holy Spirit to move in us and among us all. We'll conclude that silent prayer by singing, Hear our prayer, O Lord.
We're gathered here in the confession that our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Lord, through, who throughout these 40 days is our next song. We're going to sing all five verses. Lord, who through... Sorry. Lord, who through these 40 days for us did fast and pray, Teach us with you to mourn our sins and close by you to stay. As you with Satan did contend and did the victory win, oh, give us strength in you to fight in you to conquer sin. As you did hunger and did thirst, so teach us, gracious Lord, to die to self and so to live by your most holy word. As you did hunger, raise the tents, and through your passion tide, forevermore in life and death, O Lord, in us abide. Abide with us that through this life of doubts and hope and pain, an Easter of unending joy we may at last attain. You may be seated. The song reminds us that we're in the season of Lent and that it's a time of remembering the cost for our salvation through Jesus' death and his resurrection. Hear this assurance of God's pardon through him. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. In that assurance, we're encouraged to walk in the ways of the Lord to follow Jesus' example of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We find that explained in more detail in the Ten Commandments, which we'll read responsively. Dearly loved people, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs 
with gratitude in your hearts to God. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. You shall not murder. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You shall not commit adultery. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You shall not steal. Those who have been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their hands, so that they may have something to share with those in need. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. We're going to sing together, The Lord's My Shepherd. Good morning. The uh, scripture reading of this morning talks about us taking up our cross and following Jesus. And the uh, sermon title speaks of following Jesus uh, to the cross. And this week it's my turn to say a few words about how all of this impacts my work. I work at the heart of the university, one of the most formidable institutions of any province or any nation. As a professor, I have a pretty good job. I get paid a decent salary, I travel a lot, 
and I get to wrestle with ideas, which I love to do. I wouldn't say that my work brings me to the cross, at least not the kind that Jesus faced. Following Jesus in the academy comes not so much with costs as it does with challenges, and I want to highlight a few of those. First, you might know that the churches established the most prominent universities in the Western world. Why? Because they realized then, as many realize still today, that part of following Jesus is to learn and think about God's wonderful creation. And this involves thinking about humans, their ideas, and their interactions. Learning is not for the purposes of getting a job as much as it is expanding our minds. But learning is also a challenge. Not only is it hard work, it can also confront cherished beliefs, expose false assumptions, and even call into question traditional ways of doing things. In my lifelong journey in the academy, initially as a student, and even now as a professor, my beliefs have been confronted, my false assumptions have been exposed, and my traditional way of doing things have been called into question. I've learned much from all of this, and as a result, my thinking on some things has had to change. There is no comfortable pew in the university. Second, I'm also aware that the university, the world of ideas, is sometimes fraught with wrong ideas. Political correctness is rampant on our campuses. Consumerism, individualism, atheism, and even hedonism have made big inroads into the university. Forcefully pushing against them by actively proselytizing does not win you many friends, nor does telling people that you are a Christian or that you go to church. It simply does not resonate. Nor does it go over well in an I'm spiritual but not religious university climate where all too many associate organized Christianity with rigid doctrines and closed minds. Third, but in my attempt to follow Jesus in a public university, I take a particular approach. Somewhat like Paul's engagement with the Athenians at the Areopagus, as recorded in Acts 17. As a professor of worldview studies, I teach about various worldviews. And I tell students and others that they all have a worldview. And that worldview can either be religious or secular. I also tell them that they all have beliefs of some kind, whether that be religious or secular. And I also tell them because no one has absolute certainty, they all have faith of some kind. And it's not just religious people that have a faith. I also push back on those who bash religion, particularly Christianity. Those who argue that religion poisons everything, <clears throat> that religion is the cause of all violence, that religion is against science, that the Bible is nothing but a book of myths or fairy tales, and that God does not exist. I explain that Christianity actually does require you to think, that many of the world's best scientists and philosophers are Christians, and that Christians are called to be compassionate and to love one another. In other words, I try to take the wind out of atheistic and vitriolic sails. I also have my students think about their own worldview, and this scares them. Why? 
because all too many have little sense of what they believe beyond the politically correct and the superficial. I teach them about other worldviews, religious and secular, and take them to sacred places, the last of which is always intentionally a Christian church. And here, are men, here many are astounded to learn that the church is actually more welcoming and friendly than they realized. And that for the most part, it does not tell them what they should think. And what is the result of all of this? Well, some of my students find themselves identifying again with their Christian upbringing. A few venture back to church. Many become more spiritually sensitive, but none berate Christianity or religion as they once did. What I do is all quite permissible in a public university, but it must be done in the right way, as a way of expanding people's thinking and understanding. And this can be quite challenging, but this is my job. If I am following Jesus to the cross, I certainly will not need to endure the cross as he did. Thankfully, we still live in a land of religious freedom. Thank you. Uh, I think the children now go to church school. Thank you. Worthy is Christ. Let's rise.
Good morning, good morning to you all. We will read and reflect on Mark 8, verse 27, and the first verse of chapter 9. But before that, let us pray. Dear God, as we, as a congregation, journey through this Lenten season and reflect on the cost of discipleship and the way of the cross, we take this moment to pause and hear what your word has to say to us. Quiet our hearts, God. Quiet our minds. And in this time of sadness, when we realize that one of your children has completed her journey of this life, we pray that we may sense your presence and comfort. Speak to us, God. Be near to us. Amen. Mark 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Out of my sight, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, The Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
dearly loved people of God, the text for this sermon is this. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. That sounds kind of contradictory, doesn't it? It's a challenging thought. And it made me think about those signs you see on beaches on the ocean. You know the ones that, that warn about rip currents. That's that, that big flow of water that goes out between two uh, sandbars and carries everything out powerfully out into the ocean. And the temptation is, if you get caught in one of those riptides, is to fight against it, to resist it, to swim as hard as you can back to shore, pushing against that riptide. And that sign on the beach says, don't do that. Don't fight the riptide. If the riptide catches you, you let it carry you out to ocean. Are you kidding me? That's frightening. That goes against everything that you think about when you're trying to keep your head above water and stay afloat. But the idea is if you, if you let that riptide catch, uh, carry you out to the ocean between those two sandbars, then eventually you circle around and you can cross those sandbars and not fight the riptide. You can come safely back into the shore having conserved your strength. And so by not trying to hang on to your life in the way that seems most natural, that sign warns you, you probably can actually save your life. You see what I mean? These instructions from Jesus are as difficult as following those signs on the beach. Because when you're stuck, when you feel trapped, the inclination is to try to protect yourself, to preserve yourself, to, to save yourself, to rescue yourself. Instead of to follow the discipline, the, the training, and leave yourself in God's hand. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. It goes against our inclination, doesn't it? Against, it goes against all the cliches we have about death and life and dying. We'd say, well, where there's life, there's hope. We warn people when they come to the end of their life, quoting that famous poem, don't go gently into that dark night. Resist, resist, fight. Or we look at another situation and we say, well, better a live mouse than a dead lion, don't we? You see, our culture seems to think that the worst thing in the world is death. In general, we hold on to life with a death grip. And yet Jesus' instructions then become hard to take. And you know and I know that preaching this text became a little bit more difficult when Ann Walters died on Wednesday morning. The idea of saving your life or of losing your life became all the more vivid for a lot of people in our church family, for a lot of people in the Walters family. And yet, in that light, it also challenged us to think more deeply about Jesus' call. You see, Jesus' words come to us in the gospel. The gospel is this victory message, this proclamation that Jesus has conquered death. Jesus has defeated sin. Jesus has conquered and has ushered in the kingdom of God. And yet the manner of his victory and the ways that he calls us to follow after him are unexpected. They're surprising. It creates barriers for us when, when we really think about it. You see, we read about this in a passage in which Peter and the other disciples have been following after Jesus, and we've been reading about this as we work our way through the Gospel of Mark. And so Jesus turns to them and says, well, who do people say that I am anyhow? And they gave their various answers, and we've heard some of them before. And yet despite all those positions, when Jesus pushed for a personal answer, Peter responded to the question. Despite all the other answers that had been given, Peter confessed that he believes Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, that Jesus is the long-expected anointed one. 
And now that Peter voices that conclusion and all the other disciples are nodding along wisely in agreement, yeah, yeah, we were just going to say that too. Then Jesus starts to shape their ideas and their understanding, their expectations of who the Messiah is and what the Messiah would do. And yet they don't like the picture that Jesus is painting. They resist Jesus' explanation of what the Messiah is. The disciples and a lot of other people in Jesus' day expected some sort of military confrontation with the occupying Roman forces. They expected Jesus to usher in a kingdom like the golden days, the glory days of King David and King Solomon when they were a power on the world stage to be reckoned with. And so they already were starting to jockey for position within that kingdom of God. Who's going to sit on Jesus' right? Who's going to sit on his left? But Jesus' goal is completely different. The way that he pursues the kingdom of God is completely different. Oh, it's true. The Roman occupation is a symptom of a bigger problem within the world among humankind. The problem is that the world belongs to God. He made it. But everyone, from the emperor down to the lowest of slaves, is in rebellion against their creator. Humankind has rebelled against our creator. I find myself, at times, rebelling against his commands. You too? Do you see how this has, has taken root within our culture, within our community, within ourselves? To resist the instructions of the one who made us? And so Jesus' goal, his plan, is to bring the world back to freedom from sin. To bring the world back from brokenness. To allow people to love God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. To make it a world, to make it a community where people love their neighbor as much as they love themselves. And so his aim his goal, his plan to restore shalom to the world involves taking the punishment for that rebellion upon himself. And so Jesus provides himself as a substitute. You and I know that treason and mutiny are usually punishable by death. And that's why Jesus was born. That's why the Son of God came to earth as a human child. The whole incarnation and His suffering and His sacrifice are part of God's battle plan to win this victory over death and hell and the evil one. To win the world back to allegiance to its Creator who is becoming its Redeemer and Savior. As a congregation, we're reading through the Gospel according to Mark together. We started at the beginning of February and we're working our way through the book together with the aim of reading about the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. And now I might be wrong because I keep reading and rereading stuff, going, working ahead to prepare the, the daily thoughts and, and looking behind at the stuff we've done before. But by my count, this is about the second time that Jesus has paused to warn the disciples what his plan to usher the kingdom of God is. This is the second time that, that Jesus stops and explains he's going to be rejected, that there's going to be suffering, that he's going to go on to the cross, and yet on the third day he is going to rise again. And Peter heard the first time that Jesus explained this. And it didn't sit really well with him. So this time when Jesus gets into that whole explanation, Peter's ready. And he decides to be assertive. So this time, Peter takes Jesus aside and says, no, Jesus, it's not going to happen that way. That's not the plan we have. We'll protect you first. We'll lay down our lives for you. Right? You see, Peter doesn't like Jesus' plan. He didn't see the whole picture yet. God's thoughts are higher than Peter's thoughts, or ours for that matter. And so God's plan for the salvation of the world doesn't make sense to us on first sight. The whole concept of death, and even more the concept of resurrection, is foreign. It's unexpected. And it still is odd in our minds today. 
A lot of us have been confronted with our mortality, with, with the idea of death in this past week. And we find that death is still an enemy. Death is still frightening to us. The death of someone we love is a sad event. The death of someone we love raises questions. How can there be life after death? What grounds do we have to hope in our resurrection? How can we expect that our bodies can physically be raised after they've been in the ground for a number of years, after they've been cremated, after they've been lost at sea? How would that even work? And yet the gospel, the victory message that Mark proclaims, that the Christian church has proclaimed, the gospel reveals that Jesus' physical resurrection is exactly how God's kingdom comes with power. The fact that the punishment for human sin has been completely satisfied by Jesus' death on the cross, that gets confirmed when three days later Jesus is raised from the tomb. You see, in Jesus' resurrection, God the Father is beginning to make all things new. In His resurrection, we have the assurance that the price for our sin has been paid. And God is making us new. So it's no wonder then that when Peter takes Jesus aside and starts to rebuke him, that Jesus then responds sharply back to Peter. When Peter took Jesus aside to set his master straight, that was a temptation for Jesus, one of the human temptations that he faced. The evil one could use Peter's words to tempt Jesus to try some different approach, a more human approach, something that would make sense to all the followers that Jesus had been accumulating. Let's try a more human approach to rescue this world, shall we? I mean, as a person, Jesus didn't like the idea of suffering and rejection any more than you would. Crucifixion and death held no more appeal for Jesus than it would to you. That's why on the night before he was betrayed, he prayed earnestly that God would let that cup pass from him. And yet in obedience, he went ahead with the plan. Even though Jesus, of course, would prefer to avoid the cross. I mean, people do a lot to avoid suffering, to avoid death. Our culture doesn't like suffering or death. And it shows up frequently, though, in our video games and other kinds of entertainment, and we find certain satisfaction in seeing the bad guy die or suffer. We feel a lot less comfortable when the suffering comes closer to home. We don't like to see people we love suffer. And it's probably at the root of that whole idea of legalizing assisted suicide, of ending suffering to shorten it for people that we love, to, to shorten it for their families, to shorten it for our community. And the idea of, of mercy for them kind of makes sense and kind of appeals to us, and yet the methods, the way of doing it, the, the arbitrariness of some decisions and where that line, that gets really, really fuzzy. And kind of scary, doesn't it? And yet it, it arises out of our discomfort with suffering, our discomfort with death, and yet Jesus invites us to, to embrace both of them. I mean, we have a lot of queasy feelings about suffering and about death. It's, it's no wonder that this invitation to give up our lives for others is such a daunting prospect. Oh, sure, the bravest among us kind of likes the idea of taking a blow for someone else. We kind of like the idea that, that maybe we could take a bullet for somebody someday or, or lay down our life for that lady we love or, or lay down our life for the child that we love. And if it would help, we'd cut off our arm to help that one, wouldn't we? Kind of suits our pride and our, our own pictures of ourselves. And yet other times we have difficulty with this, don't we? Sometimes it's even the simplest ways of putting the interests of others that, that seems like a big death, a big obstacle, a big, a big suffering for us. I mean, I remember as a kid the, the fights I used to have with my sisters about who got to sit in the shotgun seat. Small thing. But to give that up for somebody else, that seemed major. 
or to give up their claim to an inheritance in, in favor of somebody else, it, it seems like a big sacrifice. Maybe something too difficult to do. A minor death. To go out of our way to, to give joy to somebody else, it seems like a big mountain to cry, to climb. To put other people's interests ahead of ours demands a lot from us. It's a kind of a death. And yet Jesus warns us that that hanging on to stuff, to hang on to our lives, is a way to lose that stuff. To let go of it. To put other people's interests first. To go willingly into suffering for someone else's sake, that is a way to follow Jesus. To put their interests ahead of yours is to love them as you love yourself. And that's the way of the cross. Oh, it kills us to do that. I understand that. It's a huge demand, and it goes against everything in our nature. We're not wired that way anymore. And yet, that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to do. It's what the gospel of Christ equips us to do. Not just by following Christ's example, but by dying with Him to sin and to brokenness. And to be raised with Him in life. And to be renewed in the Holy Spirit. To be made new people in Jesus. To bear His image is to put other people's interests ahead of our own. That's what this gospel is proclaiming to us. That's the freedom we find in the gospel. To love our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah, it's a tough thing. But it's what we're invited. What we're called. What we've been redeemed in order to do. I mean, Jesus' rhetorical questions should ring in our ears throughout the week. What good does it do for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I don't know about you, but doesn't that help to put our short-term goals into perspective by those questions? in the gospel of Jesus? And here we are confronted with that. The the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And we're told again how He was rejected, how He suffered, how He was crucified and raised to life so that you can be redeemed and restored to life. What would hold you back from professing faith in Him as Christ, as Savior? You see, in His resurrection, we're being restored and renewed so that we can advance God's kingdom by loving our neighbor, by pursuing shalom within our communities. Yet I know this remains a struggle for each of us. Our sinful nature is like that riptide. Our inclination, our knee-jerk reaction to a call of suffering and sacrifice is the wrong one. Our inclination is to protect ourselves, to hold on to stuff tightly, to guard our own interests even at the expense of other people. And so it takes training. It takes discipline. The discipline of following after Jesus to give us the ability to resist those natural inclinations, to do what is right instead, to do what preserves life, to follow Jesus in bringing life and shalom. We absolutely need His help if we're going to follow Him to the cross. And yet this cost of discipleship gets put into perspective by the gospel message. Because Jesus has been and is victorious over sin and death. In Christ, we find resurrection for ourselves. His resurrection gives us hope that all who have been laid to sleep will be physically raised to life and to glory and to the kingdom that is coming. You see, it's in Jesus that we can count on those blessings and the comforts and the benefits of the kingdom of God that He has ushered in. Amen. In response, we're going to stand and sing the wonderful cross.
I'm going to lead us in our congregational prayer this morning. Shall we come to our Lord in prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you that again this morning we were able to gather here for worship and praise. And together as your people, we were able to sing praises to you. We were able to hear a testimony about discipleship. Lord, we thank you for the work that you do in each of our lives and that uh, John could share with us this morning about how that has impacted his work at the university. Lord, may we all go out from here and ready to share your faith and what, or what it means to us that we have faith in you and how that impacts our daily lives and how we can live for you in the relationships that we have in the work that we do. And Lord, we thank you that we could listen to your word, that we could hear about following you, following uh, you to the cross. Lord, as we work through this gospel of Mark, as we all look into what it means to truly be disciples of you and what an incredible cost you bore for us on the cross in Gethsemane. Lord, will you be with us as we prepare through this season of Lent, to once again look at your death, but also toward your resurrection and the hope of new life that we have in you. Lord, we thank you that you have taken care of us this week, that you've provided for us and things that we needed. 
You've given us travel mercies. But also, Lord, we also look back on this past week with some sadness as we mourn the loss of Ann Walters. Lord, will you be with the family? Will you be with all of us who now look at an empty spot? Lord, will you be with us as we uh, work through this grief, but also as we have comfort that Anne, your servant, is now in your arms. Lord, will you be with us as we prepare for a funeral service this afternoon? Lord, will you be with, uh, with the family during this time? Lord, we think of others in our church. We think of milestones that we were able to celebrate this week, birthdays. And we also look forward to, to new birth. And we know that some of, uh, some of the pregnant mothers are getting closer to their due dates. Lord, will you be with them? Will you give them strength during this last period? And Lord, will you make all things well with these new lives that are, that are growing inside of these mothers? Lord, will you be with us as we go from here this day, as we go to do our work? Lord, may we do this knowing that we have hope in you. Lord, will you bless us throughout the rest of this day? In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand for our doxology. My friends, may you grow in grace. Before we receive God's blessing, I want to share with you the game plan for a minute. After the service, there'll be coffee and other beverages available downstairs, a time to meet together as a church family. Sunday school will also go on as usually scheduled. Then at 12 o'clock, there will be a meal, and you're all welcome to stick around for that meal. There's also a time to connect with the Walters family, but also for all of us to have something to eat before the 1.30 funeral for Mrs. Ann Walters. I hope a lot of you are able to stay for that funeral service as well. People loved by God, lift up your hearts to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom. And all God's people say, Amen.